I'm Ileana Pena. I'm the quality chief uh, at Thomas Jefferson uh, for the cardiovascular line in Philadelphia. And this is my blog. We're coming off a very successful American Heart Association sessions. And among those papers that were presented was a very interesting one by Dr. Neil Dickett from Emory. Um, and Neil, welcome. Uh, and I'm so happy that you we finally got together uh, to do this. You are part of the School of Public Health at Emory? Uh, I'm primarily in medicine. I do have a secondary appointment in uh, public health, but my primary appointment is in cardiology. Because your your abstract sounds like a public health <laughs> abstract. Um, and you you talk about the price of drugs and and discussing it with the patients. I don't think that any of us really do that. Um, I, I just like almost assume that this patient's insurance is going to cover it. And then when the patients come back and say to me, did you know that I had to pay a $500 copay for X drugs? And the newer drugs, like the SGLT2 inhibitors, that seem to have these incredible benefits that happen very, very early are also very, very expensive. The irony was ridiculous. When it first came out, it was $12.50 a day you know, compared to, I think, $4 a day or something like that for an ACE or an ARB. Um, so where did you come up with this idea? I'm a clinical cardiologist, and I'm also a, a medical ethicist. And so I do a lot of work related to ethics and decision making. Um, and and really, the, the truth is the advent of ARNIs is what is what really stimulated this project when, as you described, we shifted from a package of, you know, very cheap generic drugs to having some drugs that had, you know, appreciable benefits, but also appreciable costs, such that the decisions about whether to take them became preference sensitive um, because of cost. And when decisions are preference sensitive, we know that that's a time where shared decision making is important so that we engage patients' values and priorities and real life circumstances so that we can make sure we make decisions that are in line with what they care about. Um, so the project actually started um, related to ARNI and then at, you know, after it got funded, we had the advent of SGLT2 inhibitors. And so the trial um, in terms of planning shifted a bit um, to include- Who funded you? So AHRQ. Okay. So go on, tell me about the structure of this. The primary sites were Emory and Colorado um, and then uh, we had collaborators from, from Duke and Penn and, and brought together a team of people who work in both clinical cardiology, um, ethics, and decision making. We know that uh, there are a lot of price transparency efforts happening. Uh, prices, out-of-pocket costs are becoming more available with NEMR systems and other tools are existing. But we don't know much about what happens when prices available, and we don't know how best to help clinicians and patients to have those conversations. So the basic idea for this trial was if, if, we, can, if we can build this in um, to clinical encounters, what happens to the way that clinicians and patients actually talk about their medications and, and you know, in, in what ways does it seem to impact decisions that they make? Many of the, the drugs are very cheap. I think spironolactone is like 25 cents a tablet, it's one of the cheapest. Right. Certainly, um, metoprolol succinate is also pretty cheap. Yeah. Um, Carvedilol is also generic. Um, how do you make these decisions? How, how do you structure this? What we did in this trial was we built it on the platform of the EPIC HF checklist that Larry Allen and colleagues had, had demonstrated previously helped to increase um, both dose titration and uh, addition of GDMT. And so what we did was we provided patient-specific out-of-pocket costs for essentially the, the more expensive um, items on that list. So that included um, a plerinone as well as the medicines that are not generically available. So all the SGLT2 inhibitors, um, ARNI, as well as verisigwad and Evabradine, um, since those were uh, approved uh, during the time that we were doing the study. So we added that uh, on top. Uh, it, it, so that was that, that was our intervention. The control group got the Epic HF checklist. It's not a discussion of drugs. That's right. It, it it did not have any specific information. It did have some generic information about co uh, uh, copay assistance programs on the back of the sheet, 
but clinicians and patients basically just got the list. Uh, and then the intervention group got the patient-specific out-of-pocket cost in the right-hand column of the F, uh, of an FHF checklist. And the physicians and patients both got that checklist. And what did you find? Our primary outcome was, do people talk about cost in the context of the encounter? And we saw uh, about a 19% increase in uh, occurrences of cost conversation. Um, from 49% to 68% in our primary model. Um, so we did see a, a, a significant impact in whether people talked about cost. Um, we, of course, weren't just interested in did they talk about it, but we were curious about how. Um, and we saw some interesting patterns in terms of reduction in um, things like contingency planning. So that's a little bit of a, a complex outcome, but Contingency planning is what happens that many of us, you know, unfortunately have happen a lot, which is like the situation you described above where we say, look, you know, this is a medicine, it can be expensive, I don't know exactly what it's going to cost you. When you get to the pharmacy, if it's too expensive, let me know and we'll consider alternatives, right? So that's kind of a contingency plan that's made. We did see a reduction in contingency planning from the control to the intervention, which was a nice signal that it actually did help people make more informed decisions. It wasn't statistically significant, but we saw a little bit of a signal that people were more likely when we followed up with them two weeks later to be taking the medication that they had decided upon um, when they were in the intervention group versus the control group. So there was a little, little bit of a, a, a signal that it actually does impact the kinds of uh, ways people approach the decisions. So the, the conversation could lead to more adherence? That's the hope. We have a three-month EHR follow-up that will look at this. Um, you know, this is limited. Uh, I'll be honest, right? It's a three-month EHR based, you know, what's on their what's on their record in terms of what they're taking. It's not a, um, a perfect assessment of what they're actually taking, but that's the hope, um, is that by making more in informed decisions up front, people will be able to be um, on the medicines that are, are prescribed because there'll be a better informed decision. So are your decisions ever based on when the drug is going generic? I know that one of the uh, SGLT2 inhibitors is going to go generic fairly soon. We did some focus groups with clinicians who were in our study, and one of the things they really liked was, was for some insurance companies, you know, there might be a significant price difference for patients between DAPA and impegliflozin, for example. And, and clinicians did like the fact that they could see what that was, what that was going to be so they could make an informed choice um, and patients would be on the cheaper option when they felt like they were functionally pretty equivalent um, and physicians didn't have strong views about one or the other. So that's a, that was a nice aspect of our study that people felt was useful. So you're educating the doctors too, besides educating the patients. Yeah, so absolutely. This was this was the the checklist was provided to patients and clinicians, and so th that was very intentional. One of the main roles of of price transparency tools will be to make clinicians more aware of what the individual patient might face. Because if you see 10, 15 patients in a row, you may have ten or fifteen different um, you know uh, costs that that patient may bear. When I was a uh, an attending at Case Western here, it was when everything was generic. Mm -hmm. We had created lists of pharmacies within the region that had different prices because even though, for example, Walmart would have Carvedilol for $4, you know, another a drug right across town, a CVS or a Walgreens would have very different prices. And so we started giving the patients the list of pharmacies that had the better prices when the patients went home. And that was Right around the time of the uh, readmission scare, you know, everybody's running wild about readmissions. Well, if you can take your medicines and you can afford them, uh, the chances of you getting readmitted are much lower That's right. because you're going to be better medicated. Now we know that from the strong trial. So what are you going to do next? This is really interesting. What's next? There's a couple of things we're really interested in studying, and I, I, I will preface it by saying that this is a for a reason I'll get into in just a second, it's a little bit of a tricky um, type of information to study. But, but the main thing that we want to do is study this in larger populations with more easily implementable uh, price disclosure tools. So what we did was we got um, patient-specific out-of-pocket costs through a, a partnership with a financial counseling firm. So it was pretty labor-intensive. Two weeks ahead of time, we'd identify people if they were 
willing to have their visit recorded, we would then, we didn't tell them everything that we were going to get, but we would get costs and, and whatnot. It was, it was sort of high touch um, in some sense. But more tools are being made available through the EMR that make this available at the time of the encounter. A lot of them are not quite optimized, but, but the real plan is to look at a population level as these tools get rolled out what kinds of trends are we seeing in terms of adherence and, and how do we optimize these tools in a way that can really be implemented at a large scale? You know, what, what about giving the patients the information of what one particular drug is going to add to their well-being? Uh, because, for example, if you look at Barisiguat, yeah, it had no mortality benefit at all and somewhat a hospitalization. I can't tell you what symptoms changed. I did the trial. I can't tell you if the patients were less short of breath or, you know, felt their extremities warmer, I can't tell the difference. So here's a very expensive drug yeah. for a small benefit that is not even part of GDMT. Does that enter the discussion? It's a great question about what kinds of information we can provide to help, right? Because really what patients and their clinicians are making is a sort of cost-benefit trade-off discussion. Exactly. Exactly. It, it's ideal to be able to provide both the costs and the potential benefits so that that can be really well informed. That gets harder, right? Because as you look, one of the things we wanted to do was to at least provide a mechanism for providing one part of that in a pretty efficient one page form. If you start to look at, you know, providing complex benefit information or risks or side effects, other kinds of things that gets much more complicated to think about how to do that in an efficient way that, that patients can understand. But we're very interested, I will say we're, we're looking more now at how are the benefits of different drugs being described. So there's a lot of secondary analyses that'll come out of these data because we have 247 recorded encounters. Is the benefit side being discussed? And if it is, how is it being discussed? How is the decision being framed? And hopefully we can come up with a combination of tools that will help clinicians and patients to have those discussions in a better way. We had a, a, a very, um, I thought, lovely discussion um, at the at AHA, and, and he raised a lot of really great questions about, you know, how do you, how do you measure impact? Um, you know, some things we want to just look at uptake, right? Um, and we want more people on good drugs. If the copay is cheap, right? So if if they pay five bucks a month for no matter what it is, then the right thing is to get them on more meds, right? So you want an uptake in yeah, that. Yeah. You want an uptake in that. Meds, right. If they're if the medicine's expensive and the patient has financial constraints, the right thing might be for them to choose a cheaper option, right? And so you don't want to just look at um, at sort of rates of of prescription. It it really you want the right decision for the right patient at the right time. And measuring that on a population level gets gets pretty tricky um, because you may see sort of upticks in some portions of the population and downtrends in others, and that actually might be the right thing. So we have to be careful about a kind of... When you, you compare the RNA to an SGLT2, you have alternatives for the <laughs> RNA. That's you exactly know, right. Cheaper alternatives. You have exactly. none for the SGLT2s. Exactly. Um, and sometimes I have to make that decision too, whether... The patient just can't afford both. That's and right. I will not give them the Arnie. I'll give them, you know, uh, an Allen Pro, which is four bucks for two weeks. Exactly. <laughs> or or an ARB if they're if they're ACE intolerant. Yeah. This is this is fascinating, and I'm glad you have Larry on board with you with this because Larry is a thinker and he has thought deeply about a lot of these issues with the patients. We collaborate on a number of projects and th this one really sort of started with a, a, a little bit of a, as Larry described it, a, a, a pitch I made to him in a, uh, <laughs> in, in a bar outside of the AHA. If there's ever proof of the value of, of kind of in-person contact, and Absolutely. Meeting, it's, it's the discussion that we had about this study, especially because it's really led to wonderful collaboration. All, all the ideas that, that surface are best discussed in person. That's right. Uh, I want to thank you for your time here today. I think your message is resounding. I'm not sure I have a a, uh, a solution, um, yeah. but it is an issue. It's real life, uh, and this is what the patients are dealing with, yeah. particularly in right now where we are, where food is so expensive, gas is expensive, and they're having to make choices of That's what right. they're going to buy. And here's one way that they can do it with their drugs. That's so I want to thank you again and say hello to for me to all your colleagues in Emory.
Thanks so much. I, re I really appreciate your interest in the work and, and the opportunity to talk with you about it. Thank you. And uh, this is Ileana Pina signing off. I hope you enjoyed this very lively and informative discussion. Have a great day.